The blockchain wars are really heating up and over the past 24 hours, we've had some major events. I'll share my thoughts on these in today's video, plus show you how I'm positioned in the market in this layer one multi-chain future that we're moving towards. I recently posted a video on the layer one rotation game, a game that we played fairly well over the past couple of months, as we've seen that each dog does have its day, with essentially most of these layer ones now being at, near or above their previous all time highs. But let's check out the last piece of the puzzle here, the one blockchain that could come and rule them all. Now, if you like the content in today's video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also turn on those post notifications. And if you wanna join a like-minded community of investors, check out my Patreon link down below. Plenty of conversations and informative chats going on across various ecosystems in here. So if you wanna come and contribute to this and join this exclusive Discord community, check out that link down below. Now, unless you are living under a rock, you would have seen that Solana actually went down for at least seven hours over yesterday and for parts of this morning as well. So it's not often you see a layer one blockchain with over $10 billion worth of value actually not functioning. So a bit of a headache for many investors, and I'm sure people who bought the top recently at around 200 bucks were left scratching their head and probably quite worried. So Solana mainnet beta encountered a large increase in transaction load, which peaked at 400,000 TPS. So they did push their boundaries here and it did break. These transactions flooded the transaction processing queue and lack of prioritization of network critical messaging caused the network to start forking. So their engineers were hot on the case to this, but still around 11 hours passed before they actually had this come back online. And then this update came, the Solana validator community successfully completed a restart of mainnet beta after an upgrade to 1.6.25, the dApps, block explorers, and supporting systems will recover over the next several hours, at which point full functionality should be restored. So this is a rather crazy 24 hours for the crypto community. Solana going down, all the hopes of this being the Ethereum killer, many people going all in on this blockchain as the allure of high throughput, low transaction fees was just too much to bear. However, as we can see with new nascent tech, things can break. And this is often why we have these big opportunities with huge upside potential because we are taking on risk. And you need to remember that when you're investing in these blockchains, they can break, things can go wrong and things potentially can go to zero. I'm in no ways saying that this will go to zero. I think Solana will come back a lot stronger from this. And these are just hurdles and bumps in the road along the way to a very successful future. But as you can see, a lot of crap hit the fan yesterday. Sol went offline for a few hours. Arbitrum also went down for almost an hour. Again, both of these new pieces of tech. And then Ethereum, the 2015 stalwart here, did get attacked, but it was an unsuccessful attack. And so Ethereum continued plodding along as usual. So Arbitrum put this down to a bug in the system there. And we've also got an explanation of what happened with Ethereum, which was a malicious attack from an unknown entity trying to trick the network into joining an invalid chain. But the nodes did manage to avoid doing this and they rejected that chain and continued on the longest one. So Ethereum was rather resilient in this case. And it shows you how the more established tech here, the one that's being tried, true and tested, was able to stand up to the pressures whilst other newer pieces of tech were not able to do so. So this segues us into this, the blockchain trilemma. There's three main functions of a blockchain. It needs to be decentralized, i.e. no single point of failure. It needs to be highly scalable so you can get through the amount of transactions per second to actually process useful applications. And it also needs to be secure in order to facilitate high value transactions. Now, Ethereum is struggling with the scalability. That is, of course, no surprise to anyone who's used ETH lately, paying like 40, 50, even 100 bucks for a transaction. It's not great on that front. However, it is fully decentralized. Many people are running nodes. It has the biggest node validator count out of all layer ones, and it's also secure. It's been time tested and it has hundreds of billions of dollars of value on it. And this is why you have the likes of central bank digital currencies looking at Ethereum for a ways to launch their national currencies. And then these newer layer ones, the likes of Solana, with that failure yesterday, it's obviously apparent that maybe a CBDC 
isn't now going to launch on Sol because you literally could not afford for the chain to be going down for seven hours at a time. If you're trying to transact billions of dollars worth of value, it could literally leave you up Shit's Creek. So whilst many L1s claim to be bigger and better than ETH, they do fail on typically the security and the decentralized models. Think about Binance and Binance Smart Chain. So Gavin Wood came in all guns blazing on this one. He is the co-founder of Ethereum and also the founder of Polkadot. This is one that I have tipped personally to do exceptionally well and come in with that kind of symbiotic relationship with Ethereum that's going to help Ethereum to scale and with that grow the Polkadot ecosystem and the whole crypto ecosystem in general. So he says this, events of today in crypto just go to show that genuine decentralization and well-designed security make a far more valuable proposition than some big TPS numbers coming from an exclusive and closed set of servers. So if you can't run a full node yourself, then it's just another bank. Shots fired from Mr. Wood there, but Gavin makes a valid point here because the fact is, Sol does have a very limited number of validators. And when you dig into the numbers, it does look like they have a lot of different validators, but the actual number of them that actually create the blocks is rather limited. And so arguably he's hinting at the fact that it's not very secure or decentralized. It's just going for the scalability part of the trilemma there. So someone posted down here, three projects in the top 50 where he made significant contributions. This M effort don't miss. And then Gavin posted this picture of himself in the Mamacita hat, which I've now taken on as a profile pic. This should be an NFT if ever I've seen one. So not to dig salt out in any ways, shape or form, but here Anatoly Yakovenko came in, the CEO of Solana, better now than when it's billions of users. And this is a very fair point. Clearly we're still early in the blockchain wars or the kind of mass adoption of crypto in general. And for this to happen at this stage clearly is not as damaging as a couple of years down the line when we do have billions of users and maybe for example you're running international payrolls on your blockchain and then it goes down on a friday leaving many people rather upset so again these are hurdles and challenges that the teams will overcome and salt is very well funded from huge vcs in the industry so i'm sure money will not be an issue in solving these hiccups again he then posted this the life of an engineer is to always work on stuff that's broken never on anything that already works again a fair point as they are trying to seemingly solve the problem of having a huge scalable blockchain if they can get security and decentralization issues out of the way and still go through with like 400,000 transactions per second, then this will be probably the blockchain that DeFi runs upon due to the low cost nature of it. So big shout out to Solana. They've clearly started to work through their problems and the engineers have the blockchain up and running right now. Then Cryptopathic chimed in with this, and this is a good bit of alpha here and something to think about when setting up your portfolio split. Clearly, the more established tech should get a larger allocation in your portfolio than newer up and coming blockchains. And you never want to go all in on up and coming blockchains due to the fact there can be issues. So he says this, it's completely fine for new tech to have server problems like Solana, even at huge valuations, but it should concretely illustrate why time tested platforms are more attractive investments. And this comes a day after Kathy Wood was on the Bankless podcast talking about Ethereum and how she's so bullish on it and she's going to up her portfolio allocation to 40% ETH. So smart money continuing with the Ethereum narrative and although there's been a lot of hype around L1s right now you've got to recognize that ETH is the king. So over on DeFi Llama we can see the various blockchains, how many protocols they've got, their TVL change over the past seven days for example, their total TVL and their market cap to TVL ratio. So these are really interesting stats to mull over and go through. But what this brings me to is the fact that you need to look at this kind of data when allocating your portfolio, because Ethereum is clearly the number one here. It has the biggest TVL. Most people trust in it. They put a large amount of value on it and they don't expect this to be going away anytime soon. Whereas previously in other cycles, we've seen the likes of NEO and EOS come and go. The apparent Ethereum killers pretty much ghost chains at this point. They're not even on the list 
that you can see in front of you, they are way down if I kept scrolling. So clearly when allocating a portfolio, you want to have a lot of security in that unless you're just YOLOing your money. And so for me personally, ETH is the biggest bag that I have. And then running through these, I have major security issues with Binance and there were so many rug pulls on BSC chain that I'm no longer really in there at all. Solana is one that I kind of missed the boat on, to be honest with you, should have bought it earlier in the year and I'm not willing to buy in at what is it like 160 bucks now when it was $3 back in January. Notable absentee from the list is Polkadot due to the fact the parachains are not yet live and so it doesn't have a TVL so it doesn't show on this chart. But I have a big bag of Polkadot and I believe that this one could be the number two blockchain overall. And then rolling through the list I now have a large bag of Terra. I really like what they're doing with an algorithmic stablecoin backing up this ecosystem. I think for DeFi to thrive, you have to have a decentralized stablecoin. We're seeing the SEC put a lot of pressure on USDC and USDT, but seemingly UST is untouchable. So I think that this blockchain has huge room to grow. Then we have the likes of Polygon, Avalanche, of course, Arbitrum, the scaling solution for ETH and Phantom, all of which I have small positions in, but nothing major to really write home about. And this is how I would kind of structure my portfolio in the L1 scene, higher weightings to the ones that have got the tried and true track records, and then maybe slightly lower amounts to blockchains that I believe will do very well. And then smaller single digit percentages in your outside bets, the ones that you think could grow considerably. And for me personally, I think Phantom is that one. Market cap of around 3 billion. And for me, it's not all that dissimilar from Avalanche with a market cap of around 11 or 12 billion. So an easy three or four X to get up to there. So let's have a look at some stats here. Total number of validators on popular blockchains. This from Coin98 Analytics. If you're not following these guys, I don't know what you're doing. Go and give them a follow. Absolutely epic stats they put out on a daily basis. You can see the Ethereum number of validators is off the chart here. Elrond around 3,200, Cardano around 2,000, Avalanche around 1,000. And the number of validators is of course important for that decentralization aspect. You can see Solana has just under 1,000, then you have roughly around the same number for Kusama and around 297 for Polkadot here, 130 for Terra, and the list goes down as we go across here. So this is something to definitely factor into your weightings. But for me, you can see that Polkadot is rather low right now, but I think once the parachains go live, there will be impetus on improving this number. Total number of transactions wise, Solana, the most popular for users, over 25 billion transactions, then Tron in second with 2.35 billion, and then ETH with 1.25 billion. But the number of transactions doesn't necessarily mean a strong blockchain. As we can see, Tron is there in number two. And I don't think many people will be securing their life savings on the Tron blockchain as it is highly centralized. But again, these are all factors that you want to look at and analyze when investing and putting your layer one weightings together. Now, technically, Polkadot is actually a layer zero. It sets the foundation with a shared security model and then has blockchains running on top of it. It's essentially a blockchain of blockchains. Now Moonbeam and the Kusama version Moon River are essentially the EVM compatible smart contract platform. This will actually allow Ethereum contracts to be ported over onto Kusama and thus take advantage of a very low cost environment whilst maintaining security. So this one's been hyped up recently and as you can see the market cap in comparison to these other layer ones is rather tiny. So this is one you definitely have on your radar, currently around 415 bucks. You could have got involved with this by bonding your Kusama to their parachain. So the people who did this have been very, very happy as it's gone from like five bucks up to around 415 right now, an insane gain. But this will also come to the Polkadot ecosystem with a parachain and the token for that will be called Glimmer. So that is what I'm definitely hoping to bond my DOT tokens for. As you can see that this has had an impressive run and I would expect that Glimmer will actually get a bigger market cap than Moon River. So although the current setup is like this, ETH number one, Cardano two, Solana three, and so on and so forth, over the course of this bull run, you're gonna see a huge movement across these. I think we're really gonna sort the wood from the trees and you're gonna see where the big money starts to place their bets. Essentially, wherever the huge funds, the hedge funds, the 
institutions of the world start to park their money is where they feel the blockchain trilemma is most well met. And so the TVL on the dominant chains that are selected will probably be leaps and bounds away from the competition. Right now, things are kind of even across the board. Of course, there are discrepancies but there's no huge chasm between the top ones. So this is a really exciting race and war to be uh, watching from the sidelines here and trying to see exactly what blockchain comes out on top. So as Polkadot is a big pick for me, when parachains? Well, on October the 13th and 14th, the Substrate guys actually have their biggest Substrate event of the year called Sub Zero. And this neatly follows just after the second round of Kusama parachains. So I would definitely think we're going to get some form of acknowledgement of the Polkadot parachains around this date, if not formal recognition of the start dates. So parachains on Polkadot expected for the end of this year. We'll be keeping my ear to the ground for what happens during this event for that. Polkadot in a nice uptrend here, but still 26% or 27% off its all-time highs. Remember, if you had bonded Kusama for Moon River, you would be up significantly right now. And so I expect a lot of people will be buying Polkadot tokens to bond to the likes of the Moonbeam Parachain Auction. And this will cause the Polkadot price to go sky high. So there we have it, the blockchain wars. Many of these layer ones battling out for dominance, trying to be the biggest capturer of total value locked and bringing about various use cases from DeFi to NFTs to central bank digital currencies. Now, I hope you enjoyed the content in today's video. If you did, please slap a like on today's video. And if you want to join our Patreon and our exclusive Discord, check out the link down below. I'll see you in the next one, guys. Goodbye.